of the Missouri, in the lonely wilds of the Canadian Rockies, is a raw and rugged land that men call the Kootenays. Though few of nature's creatures have ever dared to brave the Kootenays' craggy heights, this realm is home to Maine to a proud and lusty breed, the mighty Rocky Mountain Bighorn, monarch of the land. And the monarch of them all was Sultan father on this fine spring day to a sprightly newborn lamb named Crag, who was destined one day to become himself a legend. But for the time, Crag's achievements would be of a humbler sort. For now, his efforts all were spent in testing new-made limbs under the watchful eye of Shandala, his mother. Like the other lambs born on that day, Craig had never seen his father. For while the solitary rams kept to the rocky heights, the ewes and lambs enjoyed the fresh spring grass of the upland meadows. Craig was quick to strike up friendships, and in no time he'd nosed up to Fern, a kindred spirit with whom he might share that special joy appropriate to the first day of one's life. But in the Bighorn's world, such playtime is short-lived, for lambs like Fern and Crag arouse the appetites of all the hungry predators. And today, that hunger soared on silent wings. To the golden eagle, a newborn lamb was choice and easy prey, and the Bighorn knew that her best hope was to keep the herd together. strategist whose plan was to strike panic in the herd, scattering the lambs and ewes and driving Crag away. sheep was powerless against the eagle's talons, and in the end, when things seemed at their worst, it was simple stubbornness and courage that was enough to save the day. The lesson of the eagle would serve Crag well in the days to come reminding him that for his kind, safety resides in numbers. But sober thoughts seemed far away as spring slipped into summer, and in those months of plenty, Crag grew strong and sturdy. When the herd was on the move, Shandala was ever wary, watchful for the danger she knew stalked the mountain trails. Even the 
cougar, though, knew better than to risk attack on the body of the herd. And for now, it could afford to wait till the time was right, and the odds were in its favor for a kill. Craig and Fern were accomplished mountaineers, and they gamely followed as the herd pressed on to the favored pastures where the grass grew sweet. All through the early weeks of summer, the rambling trek continued, until the coming of the long, dry days of August, when the troop at last came down from the lonely highlands to quench their thirst in the cool, clear lowland stream. It was here, however, if anywhere, that danger lurked, particularly for a greenhorn lamb away from the herd. This was nothing more than a chance to explore some unfamiliar country. But Shandala was well aware of the price that might be paid for idle curiosity. for survival that told him he must run, and run he did, till he could run no more. And then he knew that for the first time in his life, he was alone and lost. Nightfall found the herd long gone and far away, with Crag no longer able to go on. <laughs> and so, confused and frightened, he called on all the courage that he had to face his first night as an orphan in the wild. began with promise, it would not be long before Crag was forced to come to terms with a whole new set of problems.
Despite the fact he'd never seen a coyote, there was something about this pair that told him they meant trouble. had managed to escape the jaws of the coyotes. But he'd stumbled smack into an even bigger stew. Never in Cragg's young life had his future looked so bleak. For Scotty McGraw had a well-earned reputation as the toughest and the best of all the hunting guides around. A man who'd bagged his share of bighorns. But luckily for Craig, he had a lot of growing up to do before he'd interest Scotty as a trophy. Whatever the reason Scotty had for saving Craig's life, it was enough for Craig to know that once more, he was free. Though the fact remained, he was still as lost as ever. about as good as dead. And it was pure good fortune that caused Craig's tracks to cross those of the herd. To be back with his own kind could only mean that Craig's troubles were finally over. But he wasn't in the least prepared for the reception that was waiting. The problem was, Craig was now an orphan, and as it happened, none of the ewes were interested in adoption. And without a ewe to protect him, the odds of his survival were very slim at best. But it was just about then, when things looked grim, that Craig found his old friend, Fern. And one thing he knew for certain, she would not reject him. Together, Fern's scent had rubbed off on Craig. And from then on, he was accepted as part of the family. It was good to belong, to be home again. Especially now when change was in the air. For soon the crisp, clear days of autumn would give way to the first snows of the season. By ancient urges, the band of ewes and lambs would now make their way to the high plains of the Kootenays, there to await the annual reunion with the rams. Sultan, in his lordly fashion, would return to claim the right which each year he must reaffirm in combat with the boldest of the bighorn bucks, contenders for the role of leader of the herd.
all seem strange, and yet compelling, too, this tournament of valor in which he, too, one day must compete. These jewels might last for days, but here few challenge the big ram, knowing the outcome would be the same. For once again, Sultan proved that he alone was fit to be master of the herd. And so he led his harem, as he had for years before, through the snowbound ranges in search of winter's forage. It was a cold and bitter time, a time to test the mettle of the hardiest of creatures. snowed for months in that high country as storms swirled out of the north and lean times fell upon the herd. Now the carefree days that Crag had known were forever far behind and for the first time he was forced to face the brutal fury of the Rocky Mountain winter. It was the way of things that in each winter, some among the herd were lost, while others, stronger, more resilient, managed to endure to see the coming of the spring. These were nature's restless days, days to celebrate the awakening of energies pent up since the fall. Yet with the spring, Crag would face a painful fact of life. For now, his foster mother would leave the herd for the far-off highlands to give birth. And Crag, not yet a full year old, would be left to join the ragged ranks of the band of bachelor rams. So for Crag, the years passed. As he grew in size and strength, he grew more skilled at the arts of combat, essential to his survival. Then at last, the time arrived when Crag felt ready for the final test, a challenge to old Sultan for the right to rule the herd. Now, all Craig's battles have been sparring matches, mere rehearsals. But this time, even Fern could sense that the struggle was in earnest. failed to consider his father's well-tested skill and power, and the price he had to pay was steep. Banished from the herd, he now was forced to wander through the grim months of the winter on his own. Now the lush times of summer were a vague receding memory and solitude, the curse of Crag's young life, returned to haunt his days. Yet in nature, all things change in time, and so the winter passed, with the spring, the mountain world was born again. 
The long, cold weeks had left Crag lean and weary. But he'd met the test. He'd seen the winter through. He'd survived. If only to face still another test. It was a preseason scouting trip that brought Scotty McGraw back to the Kootenai Highlands. It had long been Scotty's habit before the shooting started to find out for himself the whereabouts of the herd. For he'd found it a surefire method of guaranteeing his clients the most prized of all the trophies, a mighty big horn head. So it seemed almost certain that in time, Craig and Scotty would cross paths again. Though Craig couldn't have sensed that the return that fall of the very man who once had saved his life would present a threat to him more grim than any he'd ever faced before. It was the opening day of the hunting season, and Scotty had returned to the mountains loaded for big game. With him this time was a wealthy client from the east whose sights were squarely set on a handsome bighorn trophy. There was an air about the whole affair that smelled suspicious to Craig. Something that told him to keep his distance until he could learn what the intruders had in mind. Fortunately, Craig was at home on the sheer rock slopes, where the men dared to follow only with back-breaking effort. And for the time, at least, it was a simple thing to stay safely out of their reach. But Scotty was ready to spend days, if he must, in search of a suitable ram. And he'd continue to search if he had to comb every square inch of the Kootenays. and yearlings were of no interest to him. And Scotty just have to keep looking till he turned up a real big horn. In the days that followed, though the men were often in sight of Crag, they saw nothing of him. And by the end of the week, Scotty was more than a little disappointed. It was then, however, that he heard a sound that could only be described as music to his ears. he'd met on the trail. But the glint of Scotty's glasses gave the game away. Scotty lost a real opportunity. But he was far from giving up, for he'd seen the big horn that he wanted. And he was bound to have that ram's head for his client's wall. As far as Craig could tell, the danger was safely passed. For days had gone by since the hunters left the mountains. But as he was to find out, he'd yet to see the last of the man called Scotty McGraw. And now a strange new element had been added to the hunt, 
For Scotty knew a dog could track the big horn up slopes where men moved slowly. Hunting with dogs was against the law, but Scotty was getting desperate now. His reputation was riding on the line. before, he was now well convinced of the hunter's deadly purpose. were plainly outmaneuvered. And so the first round went to Crag. But Scotty was no beginner at this game, and he still had some old-time hunter savvy working on his side. In time, as Scotty knew full well, thirst would drive Crag down the hill in search of drinking water. And once the trap was set, all the hunters had to do was wait. blow to Scotty. Well, the hunting season was over now, and he'd run out of schemes to try. So his client would have to go home without a bighorn trophy, and Scotty would be left to lick wounds of his own. But there was no ram in all these hills that had ever managed to defeat him, and Scotty was not about to let Crag be the first. As they will, the seasons turned, and winter found Crag still alone, searching for a herd to which he could belong. Autumn was now far behind, and after all this time, Scotty was the last thing on Crag's mind. For Scotty, this was no trophy hunt, but a personal vendetta, for to save his reputation, he was out to gun down Crag by any means he could. And from that moment on, there'd be no rest for either, till one of them went down in defeat.
Winter was cruel to the hunter, but he had one clear advantage, for the trail was obvious and easy to follow. And all Scotty figured that he needed was a good, strong dose of perseverance. yards is the range of Scotty's rifle, and at half that distance, Craig made an easy shot. Scotty lost the all-important element of surprise. And from now on, the contest between the two would be more evenly matched. For days on end, Cragg managed to stay just ahead of Scotty. And as long as he kept the man in sight, he knew that he'd be safe. It was a deadly game of hide and seek that Cragg and Scotty were playing. But it was a game that Cragg was well prepared to win. His strategy was to lead the man around in endless circles, hoping in the course of the hunt to wear him down in body and in spirit. But Craig had failed to take into account the character of his opponent, for Scotty was ready to press the hunt no matter how long it took. Overnight stops were brief at best, and each morning, soon past sunup, Scotty was back on the trail. For he could allow little time for rest for either himself or Craig. Scotty drew upon all the skills he could muster to stalk Crag through those hills. But whenever he thought he was close, like a ghost of the snow, the Kootenai Ram had vanished. <laughs> days of winter, Scotty tracked him. And as the weeks went by, a peculiar kind of closeness developed between the two. For together, they were forced to share the hardships of that cruel season.
Through storm and sun, Crag sought the herd, which he knew was his only hope, his best chance for survival. But now, a new and different set of tracks added urgency to the hunt. And even though Scotty as yet was unaware, he himself had now become the hunted. a half mile ahead of his pursuer. And Scotty, knowing that he could not lose ground, continued to press the hunt. But determined as Scotty was, the rugged terrain began to take its toll. And although he hadn't lost any ground to Crag, the cougar had closed the gap with ease. curious way, that cougar had saved Craig's life, but he'd about run out of chances, and from here on, it'd take more than luck to escape from Scotty's rifle. For the man came from stubborn stock, and the tougher Craig made the challenge, the more determined Scotty grew. In fact, it soon developed that Scotty and Crag fell into a strange routine. For when Scotty rested, Crag rested too. But always just out of the rifle's range. In a sense, it seemed that each of them knew the limits of the other. And thus, it became strictly a matter of which would falter first. Hunger added misery to Crag's misfortune. But the going was rough for Scotty as well, and both had begun to weaken. He'd pretty well used up all his strength, and it was time for desperate measures. Time to try out one last scheme that just by chance might work. According to habit, Crag stopped for the night a safe distance from Scotty's camp, assured that morning would find them back to the same old routine. timing was off, and what was worse, the smoke from Scotty's camp had drawn bad company to the scene. A starving pack of timber wolves, hungry for a kill. It was a lot. 
last thing Scotty'd permit. To let this ram be lost to the likes of these. And he'd fight to the death to prevent it. and bewildered, Crag now gave Scotty the very chance he'd struggled for weeks to get. And this time, he was not about to shoot till he had Crag in his sights. It was over. There was no need to pull the trigger. Scotty knew that he had won. And to kill Crag now would have gained him nothing. For after all, he had to admit he admired that big horn ram. An adversary such as he had every right to live. So they went their separate ways. And Crag, relieved at last of the deadly threat that through all these weeks had dogged his every step, foraged where and when he could, and as he did, grew stronger with each day. Toughened by all he'd endured, he was by winter's end as strong a ram as any in the Rockies. And yet one nagging need remained to be fulfilled. <coughs> On the western slope of the Kootenai Range, Crag found the herd at last. And as he well expected, a welcome was in store. Through all the years, Sultan had held on to the leadership of the herd, and all the other rams had come to accept him as master of the herd. But Crag had an old-time score to settle, and the time had come to settle it. The battle raged for hours on end, with neither yielding ground. Newfound strength and prowess won the upper hand. 
the duel was done, and Sultan's reign was ended. Now Crag was master of the herd. So it was the legend came to be of Crag, the grandest and the proudest of all the bighorn rams that ever ruled the Kootenays.